you going guys? We're at the cabin. It's been a pretty uneventful trip. I broke the trail to a couple places where I might set some beaver traps if I don't get everything out of here, but there was uh, quite a few lynx tracks. No, not quite a few. I think three places I saw lynx tracks, all singles. And at one spot they they walked past one of my sets by within 15 feet and just never even looked at it. So there's, you know, there's lots of rabbits out there. I don't think they're overly hungry, but anyway, they put up some scent for them and some more and a little bit more bait. Might make a couple more sets on the way out, but you know, being so uneventful, I thought maybe I'd best do a, a story time. I'm just trying to think of a what to do a Sorry, better not eat that thing. Kind of crunchy. Had a chat on the phone last night with a, a viewer. He's uh, going to buy one of my black wolves off me. And, you know, something we talked about, I thought it'd make a good chat. I don't know, is that the camera fogging up? Yeah, I think so. Maybe I better just postpone this for a second until the camera warms up. Okay, if it fogs up again, we'll, we'll wait a bit. But anyways... We were talking about uh, some of the other YouTubers, and I mentioned a fellow named Sam Woods, which I watched, you know, a couple of his videos, and he's a he's got a big following, and uh, he's very, very much full of energy sort of guy, and uh, got some good videos out there. But I I just remember seeing one video that was said the. I think it was titled something like the number one most important secret to becoming a really successful trapper. And so I thought, well, I better, I better watch this. And well, it, it ended up being time management. Yeah. You know, of course that's the number one secret to everything in the world, but, but it got me to thinking, you know, what did I think was most important? Um, you know, obviously time management, but like I, I mentioned to Bill on the phone, you know, I would say probably just paying attention. When I was younger, you know, I used to think of myself as a, a student of nature, I guess you'd call it. I, I study animals' habits. You know, when I was 13, 14 years old, before the duck hunting season was even on. I would go out to the marsh behind my house and just sit on the beaver house there with my duck call and just talk back and forth to the ducks just to, you know, learn what different, you know, quacking, you know, what sounds, what they seem to make and stuff like this. And I love to sit and listen to ravens because they have such a a huge vocabulary and, and you know each thing seems to mean something different when they don't know you're there the 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 talking that they do is pretty uh, pretty neat wolves as well like I mean I can howl up wolves like from a distance you'd never uh, you know I've been told that you'd never could have obviously I've never been from a distance from myself when I was howling but people you know told me there's you, know, you can't tell the difference but that's just from you know listening and stuff like that. But you know, the main thing about paying attention is as you're traveling through your trapping areas, you know, watching where tracks go, um, watching how they react to, you know, like a wolves following your trail and stuff like that, how they react to a tight spot in the trail. 
you know, if you've got a wide open trail and all of a sudden there's a spot where a tree fell over or something, you know, watching what wolves do there, it'll make a, you know, a huge impact on how you set your snares. Um, you know, like learning animals like otter, um, beaver are pretty basic, you know, I mean, they leave so much sign of where they, they trip pass by, you know, their trails into the, their feed trails into the bush, trails over the dam, entrances in the house and stuff like that. But, you know, knowing that, you know, like on a normal year, I might catch, you know, one small beaver for every 10 I catch. You know, this year was a little higher, obviously, because I was cleaning out some houses. And I think I ended up, I got like 130, two beaver right now. And I think 20, 24 of them are, or 23 of them are kits, somewhere in that range. And then a, a couple of mediums. But every, you know, all the other ones, there's about 100 of them, a little better than that, that are large or better in and quite a few. I think I got 23 triple extra large and then about 20, I think it's 32 double extra large. But anyways, what the point I was getting at there is, you know, knowing that if you put a trail set out there and you put scent on it, you are gonna get the little beavers coming. The farther away I put my traps from the beaver house, the more likely you are to catch bigger beaver. Um, entrances, you have no, you know, real say in the matter. If you're setting an entrance set, you're just going to, you know, take what you get because they're just all flipping in and out of there. And, but like I said, you know, you if you're in open water setting with, with beaver caster, you are increasing your odds of catching catching uh, little beavers just because they you know they're so curious and stuff like that and so in a normal trapping season I don't use a lot of caster scents but you guys saw this fall when I was trapping them beaver the uh, you know I was putting scent on everything because like I said I was cleaning out those houses just gonna clean that screen again there guys But, um, you know, and, and watching, like, even now as you travel, watching where you see, you know, your mink tracks, knowing that, and I know some guys are going to disagree with me, but ridges with pop, mixed bush, poplar, jack pine spruce, for myself is the number one spot to, to set martin traps mature forest that is um, another spot if you've got mature forest along the edge of a, a regen cutover area and it's you know growing up in there you uh great spot to to set because the martin will come along and they will skirt out around the edge of that region before they go into it most of the time one of my trap lines in ontario had a you know a major power line that went through the middle of it and you know, we're talking one of the ones that's a uh, hundred yards across opening, I guess, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit less, maybe 200 feet or whatever it is. But uh, the you know, just knowing that Martin will not 99 out of 100 Martin will not cross that open area, and. You know they don't even like to come close to it so when you've got a, a power line like that going through your line it's you know it's like having two separate lines as far as martin are concerned it doesn't bother other animals it just seems to be martin and and like i've always said because the big trees are their safety net the uh, open areas those great gray owls they they just love to pick up martin and uh and so they get into an open area like that and they're they're done for but you know and so when I first started trapping there I would set the traps right on the edge of the you know so that I could just see them from my skidoo as I drove by down on the edge of the power line 
you know, and it, I, I made a, a few trips in there and it was like nothing, you know, I got a mink and a martin box, um, got one martin at, a, at one set, you know, and that's in three traps running about, or three checks running about 20 traps. So I, I just thought I'd take a little bit of more time and at each spot, instead of having it set there, I walked 100 feet in the bush and put the traps. And suddenly I was getting Martin all over the place. They just did not want to come out to the edge of that cutover, or to the edge of that uh, power line. You know, just paying attention to things like that and, and knowing, you know, that the animals... And, you know, with the Martin, I mean, I only, you know, realized that because when I was trapping, well, you, you probably, if any of you guys have read the book, um, know how I figured that out because, you know, walking, when you're walking for miles and miles, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can miss when you're traveling on a quad or a, or a snowmobile when you're, you know, traveling with some speed. But just, you know, when you're walking and, uh, you know, if you've got an open creek system, when you're walking, you're obviously going to utilize it because it's easier than crawling over fallen down trees and whatnot else. So, you know, walking along the edge of the bush and you'd see where a marten would, you know, come out of the bush and go three or four feet out into the, you know, the, the open area and then scoot back in real fast. And just seeing this, you know, numerous times or not seeing any marten tracks out in the open and then you go into the bush and there's marten tracks, you know, all over. It just, you know, got me to thinking about why, you know, they were doing that. And then, you know, you'd see the great gray, gray owl sitting in a broken off tree in the middle of these big beaver meadows. You know, and you, you just put two and two together and, uh, you know, and then having one time found, you know, where a martin did go out and, you know, I can't say it was a great gray owl, but it was something with big wings. And that's pretty much the, the only thing that's, you know, up in the north where I was during the winter was those great grays. The odd great horn, but, you know, and found where the martin track just ended and you could see the, the wing uh, tips in the snow where something had picked them up. You know, and then, you know, things like you're going through a little draw in the winter time, and you see a an otter track slide down through there, and you know, then you know you just notch that and stick that in the back corner of your brain. And next year, when you you know you you go setting otter traps, you know you draw up a trap in in one of these little areas, like a you know, and and bang. You know, it might sit there a week, it might sit there two weeks. It might sit there all season without catching anything. But in, unless you're, you've got so little traps that you can't afford to have one sitting there. But you put a trap there and, you know, sooner or later you're going to catch an otter. You know, just things like, and, and all the obvious stuff like muskrat and, and, you know, mink sign where you, you know, setting traps where you see the tracks all the time and stuff like that. It just... You know, I'd have to say the most important thing like that is just paying attention, um, you know, with all the animals and, and knowing their habits. It's, it's the, you know, probably to me is the most important thing. And like Sam Wood said, you know, obviously, like time management because, you know, you want to, a guy can go out there and, you know, throw a hundred traps in the bush if you don't know what you're doing and probably catch as much as, you know, somebody who knows what they're doing will catch, you know, setting, you know, 20 traps. You put enough steel out there, everything, something's bound to fall into it, so, you know, it's just time consuming to set that many traps and, uh, and just not, not a, a good, you know, Expensive time. It's uh, you know you, not only the setting, but then you're, every time you're checking, you, you're you're killing that much time. I want to just mention too for all the young guys out there. I remember when I was 15 years old, and the, the, you, you can try this. Uh, you know when you're skinning beavers, and you. Okay, I've showed you on the beavers when I'm skinning them how I cut back on the front feet. You know about that far. Because if you cut right beside the foot, 
when you stretch the beaver, then you got to trim that whole thing off anyways. But when I first started, I didn't, I didn't know that. And, and I was doing that, cutting right around the edge, right by the pad, and then skinning that whole area out. And then when I stretched it, you know, having to cut that fur off. But the neat thing about that was all my sister's girlfriends, you know, they would watch and that little ring of fur that I cut off there, I would give it to them and they would literally, and I kid you not, they would put it on their finger because it was, you know, a perfectly round ring of fur and they would wear it like that until it dried and it was a little fur ring that I gave them and they just thought that was so cool. So any of you young guys out there, if you're skinning beavers like that, there you go, it's an in for some of the girls. You can, uh, you know, give them a little fur ring and they'll, uh, they'll love you forever. But, I don't know what else we got to talk about. Um, well, I think that's about it probably. But, and the other thing too is, you know, watching for sign and knowing when you've, you know, taking enough fur out of your area. Um, for me, you know, this is such a small trap line and everybody that has a trap line around me, most of them aren't even trapping. They just, they don't do anything. So, you know, I can take, pr well, if this was back in Ontario on my big lines, I would never trap so hard that this, you know, especially Martin, because Martin are a dumb animal. Um, I would never trap so hard that, you know, I stopped seeing this many tracks. But, you know, that was like my line was 200 square miles basically. And, and so, you know, you didn't have a lot. Of, if you're trapping the whole center of it out, then, you know, you're, you're hurting yourself for the following year. And otter as well, you know, otters are an exceedingly easy animal to trap if you know their habits and, uh, you know, my, my old trap in Ontario, I normally took 15 to 17 beavers, or beavers, uh, otter a year. And then one year I decided to see how many I could catch. And I ended up with 27 otter, but the following year I caught one and there was not a track anywhere. Now, the good thing about otters, you know, most members of the weasel family, they're great travelers. So it doesn't take long to get them, you know, back into the swing of things. And it was, I think, three years later where I was back up over, you know, in the 15 a year range. So they, you know, they will come back pretty quick, but that's how, how much it takes to completely, you know, decimate the population. Seven, 15, 17, no problem. 27, they're done. And that's on a 200 square mile trap line. Um, you know, granted, there were some areas way, way, way back in the along Puckasaw Park boundary there that I couldn't get to in the fall when I was trapping, because you well know that I don't trap otters in the winter time, and uh, you know, so there was some otters back way down there, but those were all watersheds that I, you know, they were from there down to, into Lake Superior and uh, you know, right through the Puckasaw Park and. I don't know if I mentioned, but my last trap line there, yeah, the whole south boundary of it was along the Puckasaw in a federal park there. And uh, it was a, an area that you were, nobody was allowed to trap. Oh, and that brings up a pretty interesting point. I was at a skidoo trail that was down there, and I was cutting it to get down to the back end of the line, and I was slowly, you know, working my way down there, following creeks and cutting here and there. And I guess the Puckasaw Park Wardens and then those federal park guys are just nasty. You know, they, it's like the, that's their, don't you dare, you know, come anywhere near it because they, uh, I guess they'd flown over. I was three kilometers, three miles or so from the edge of the park, but they flew over with a helicopter and saw my skidoo trail where it disappeared into the bush. So they went to the provincial office and you know to find out whose trap line it was and they found out they came to the I ran a, a restaurant in Ontario then 
and they came to the restaurant and called me out of the office and they're standing there in uniform and like you, you know and they were just ignorant you know they they were like are you Dave Andermer um, yeah he said there's a skidoo trail down on such and such a creek and uh, close to Puckasaw Park northern boundary he said where does it go you know and and I don't normally you know get too rude with uh, you know officers or whatnot but you know these guys they have no authority where they were standing and uh, and I just told them you know just oh the attitude annoyed me but I just said listen there's a skidoo trail there it's mine if you want to know where it goes get your skidoo and follow it and then you'll know and I just turned around and walked away and uh, you know, that was the last I heard of it. But they're so, so protective of that park. Like, oh my gosh, that somebody should bring a motorized vehicle, you know, 100 feet into the edge of it. You know, and, and I know they, you know, the park is huge. And they wanted, they were trying to force the provincial government, and I don't know if they ever did it because I moved away, but this huge park and then they wanted to put a three mile buffer zone all the way around the park where there was not allowed, been allowed to be any logging, hunting, or, or whatever, you know, just so that, like, I mean, where does that stop? You know, you've got, and anybody out there, just Google Puckasaw Park and, and you'll see it come up. It is a monstrous um, federal park. And, and they wanted a three mile or three kilometer buffer zone all the way around it. So that nobody could bring a, a skidoo in there or a quad or well, not like you'd get a quad there anyways, but you know, just crazy stuff like that. But it was just funny the, those those guys and their attitude, you know, just uh, what can you do? But anywho, I'm gonna head back out and maybe set another link set on the way out and uh, we'll go from there. Happy trails guys, keep your boots dry. Ooh, that's nice and warm. Yeah, it's minus six Fahrenheit outside still. So, you guys, you can put this on a loop and play it over and over on your computer. And Almost be like you're sitting beside the wood stove. 